Hello and a very good afternoon. I am Renu Zamgaukar from the Goethe Institute Pune in India and welcome you on behalf of the Goethe Institutes in India and Bangladesh once again to our two-day international conference M3 Man, Male, Masculine. In this conference, we have brought together intellectual and cultural perspectives from experts and artists from South Asia and Europe on the theme of masculinities. Thank you for joining us in this session titled Gaming and Masculinities. Anokhi Shah, our wonderful speaker today, will present an overview of the gaming landscape and a brief history of its evolution into the games we see today. The session will focus on how a predominantly male industry with a very high youth engagement can be used as a tool for reframing gender identities and its potential to build empathy for its users in an innovative lived experience environment. Anokhi Shah is an architect, artist and a new media designer based in Pune and Frankfurt. She has her own interdisciplinary design research startup named IOVR Space. She works currently with the Tifa Working Studios in Pune as a curator and has curated multiple art exhibitions in India and Europe. Thanks Anoki for joining us today. Just a little bit about the session hygiene before I give over to Anoki. A question and answer session will follow this talk session where you will have the chance to post your questions in the chat box. Request you not to post questions before the Q&A session is announced. Wishing you all an insightful and fun session. Over to you, Anoki. Thank you, Reno. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, nice to virtually meet you. Uh, I'm just going to get started with the session. Um, going to put on my presentation. Um, thank you for having me here today, uh, Goethe Institute. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways to look at what a video game is. Uh, the origin of the video game was a creation of a completely new medium. Taking something as passive as the TV and turning it into an active, interactive medium. Um, long before the internet or cell phones, uh, when computers were not even invented yet, uh, there were a handful of visionaries uh, that used the aspect of video games to kind of reimagine the world. It was something like magic, you know. Um, I want to begin uh, talking with arcade games. Uh, so ping pong and other games were kind of the beginning for arcade games. Um, improvements in computer technology and gameplay led to this golden age of arcade video games from the late 1970s to 1980s. Um, then there was also a resurgence uh, in the 1990s to the mid 2000s uh, with new games. Um, uh, arcade games uh, soon enough uh, caught attention of Atari, a game company based out of the US and wanted to be made available all over the world. Um, so the first game I'm gonna talk about is Space Invaders, which came out in 1978. Uh, designed by Tomohiro Nishikado, he's right there uh, on the left. And um, it was Japan's first arcade blockbuster. So much so that they used to call uh, centers as invader houses. And it was so famous in Japan that the, the Japanese government actually ran out of their yen coins because they were being used so much to play arcade games. Um, also around this time, uh, uh, a fictional novel by author H.G. Wells had come out called War of the World, which uh, the designer read. And he kind of started imagining the world uh, being attacked by aliens. And somehow for him, these aliens looked like octopuses. So that's why he designed uh, the enemies as octopuses. And similarly, in the, in the West that time, Star Wars had just come out. So he was very fascinated with the idea of droids. So droids are like humans, but they, they are not actually humans. They act like humans, you know. So he wanted to use this as uh, the idea of the player. So that's why uh, his player uh, icon design looks like a droid. 
Um, this game got so famous that Atari had the first video game competition, uh, uh, which was organized in the 1980s. Uh, so this competition was won by Rebecca Heinemann uh, and in an interview with her experience about the game and the competition, she says, and I'm quoting her directly, when Space Invaders came out, it was the hottest game out there. But it was also the first game that had strategy. It was all about the patterns. Um, the game allowed me to be myself. Um, so if you notice, this game does not have any gender bias. It's basically the character in the game space or in the alien space, and it can find the character can find its own peace and solace. Uh, Rebecca was also initially when she won the competition, she was Bill Heinemann, but now she's a transgender female, and also she's the first video game tournament winner in the world. Uh, now she's also a game designer herself. Um, or this is how uh, gaming competition look nowadays. So this is a photo probably from 2019 before COVID. And uh, that's how game competition looks. They're called eSports and they are a huge multi-million dollar industry and very, very popular in gaming worlds. Competitive video game uh, is something that is so popular that it's famous all around the world. It's basically when people see their high scores up on the screen, it encourages them to kind of want to beat those scores. And this, this is called a replay attempt. And uh, within video games, this idea is called the flow. Uh, the flow is something that uh, a lot of different people get. Athletes get it, musicians get it. Basically, it has to be a fun activity with the right amount of challenge. Uh, with a clear set of rules and outcomes uh, so that with intense practice, it basically pushes your skills to the limit and you lose complete track of time. You're in the zone. Uh, that's why when you see children or adults hooked to a video game for hours at a stretch, not eating, not sleeping, they're basically in the flow. Um, so um, Space and well Invaders prompted a revolution in the video game industry and many more companies uh, started designing new video games and competing for these, for these kind of quarters. I'm gonna reduce it a little bit. Um, at that time, uh, a new game company called Nintendo came out, which uh, was originally a Japanese company, but they also wanted to target the audiences or games in the West. Um, and designer Toru Iwatani uh, moved to New York for a bit to you know, try and get uh, inspiration and ideas. And one day he just went out to get a pizza uh, because he was hungry and he removed one slice. And when he did that, he noticed the shape of, of the pizza and he was so excited by it that that's how the shape and the origin of Batman came out. Uh, but he knew that the idea is one aspect of the game. The visuals need to be strong enough. So he actually started working on the game. Uh, and Nintendo at this point noticed that arcades around the world were places of for men. Uh, in so many parts of the world, they were like dark and dingy corners where basically men would go and play uh, arcade games. So they wanted to change that. So they started thinking of what kind of games would women like to play. Um, on the other hand, uh, Steve Goldson, who was at that time at MIT and his friends, uh, they put arcade games in their dorms. <laughs> this was their way of making extra money to pay for their tuition because people were hooked to games. So they wanted to do that. Um, what they didn't anticipate is the smart nerds at MIT would at some point become so easy, uh, uh, easily challenged by the game that at some point they stopped playing because it was no longer challenging for them. So Steve Goldson and his friends were like, okay, what can we do to like make it more challenging? So they started modifying the games themselves and they started making these enhancement kits. Uh, and every time they would get a new game, they would modify it for themselves and for the, for the other people in the Institute so that they could continuously keep getting the money. At some point, Nintendo caught wind of what Steve Paulson and his friends were doing, and they basically took them to court. Uh, at this time, they were already working on the Pac-Man edition, and 
Nintendo wanted to modify their Pac-Man game for women. So they called it a truce. And that is how Miss Pac-Man originated, centrally targeted for like women audience. And uh, made it cute, made changed the visuals a bit, changed the maze a bit, and that's how it looks. Um, um, so the next game I want to talk about is called Donkey Kong, which was designed by Shigeru Miyamoto, who is basically uh, Nintendo's, he's known as Nintendo's star game or legendary game designer. Um, had, this game had a simple narrative, rescued the damsel in distress. Um, the player, which is the character, would try and move up where Kong the gorilla would have the damsel captured. Um, however, this player is pretty iconic and he later moved on to have his own game. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about game consoles now, which was the next new revolution that happened. Uh, soon, obviously, game companies tried to design video game consoles, which you could have interchangeable cartridges. This allowed you to have a console at home, you could have multiple games, you could have a library of different games. And, you know, uh, their sales were going up and it was kind of revolutionary. Uh, Channel F was the first ever company to design a console to allow these cartridge systems. And then soon competitors followed to make their own console machines. Um, however, this allowed for a lot of new games to be released. And at that point, there were also a lot of disappointing games that came out in the market. Uh, there was a crappy mentality of quantity and not quality that um, emerged. Uh, one of the game companies, uh, Nintendo, uh, wanted to make a game specially for the console market. And uh, that's when they came out with Super Mario. And this is probably a very famous game. Everyone's probably looked at it or played with at some point. And uh, one of the great things that this game did was revolutionize sound. Sound in video games started getting way more attention. Like it became a kind of a new technological investment. Um, and this it was also designed by a Japanese guy called Hirakazu Tanaka, and he designed sound for a variety of new games. Uh, the other game that uh, a Nintendo also came out with was Tetris. This one is also super famous. Uh, I know people who still play Tetris. Um, it was one of the first games that uh, created this love for patterns, you know? And uh, so Donkey Kong, Super Mario, and Tetris were like Nintendo star games. And for that, the competitions that they held, they would have uh, uh, children compete on all these three games. Um, these games sparked so much interest that Nintendo had a huge game council department. Uh, people whose job was to just answer the phone and answer questions with difficulties about the games. And like, you know, if people are stuck in the game, they're lost and all of that. So nowadays we just Google everything. Whenever we play a game and you're, you're stuck somewhere, you can just go to Google and be like, this is my problem and you get the answer. But that time that was not the case. Um, game counselors would have these catalogs and like physical maps and things they would have to learn to kind of help people. Um, but on the other hand, in Japan, uh, print media was very, very famous. They had magazines and comics and manga and all of these things. So uh, as a business strategy, what Nintendo did is they started creating their uh, magazines, game magazines, where they would like talk about secret passages in the game and like answer difficult questions so that a lot of people would have access to it and a lot of people would buy. This was also revolutionary because it allowed for print media and visual media to kind of grow um, using game aesthetics. Um, obviously, the next big invention that brought in the new revolution with games was the, was the invention of the person computer. And uh, uh, 
the first personal computer game that I would want to talk about is called Colossal Caves Adventure. Uh, this game is super interesting because it was the first text-based game and it offered something truly unique, which was choice. Uh, it used storytelling so powerfully that you could actively be involved with the story and it did that, it played with your imagination using just words. So the idea was, can games be more than just blasting aliens of the sky or an endless back and forth of a pong ball? Could we invite the players into the world of the games and be more interactive, tell the stories in a more interactive way? Um, until yet, there was only a singular approach or like a task, you know, like rescue the damsel in distress, but there was no storyline and there was no exploration. Uh, during this time, a new board game came out in the market called Dungeons and Dragons. I'm sure many of you guys have heard of it. And Dungeons and Dragons is a game that made famous this idea of role playing games. And it's basically a group of friends trying to fight dragons inside dungeons and looking for a treasure chest. And you could uh, you could have uh, you could make magic spells and you know spawn hell and like it had all these uh, satanic ideas and so on. It had parents freaking out uh, while there were herds of nerds who would really come together and enjoy the game. Um, however, Dungeons and Dragons was never about satanic worship. It was always about storytelling and role playing. Uh, so it was soon made into a role playing video game. Uh, role playing video games are very attractive because it allows you to be a character of your own creation. The biggest appeal of this genre is that it does not create the character for you, but it allows you to create your own character. You can play as someone you aspire to be. Uh, it could be good, it could be bad, but maybe it could be someone that you cannot be in a real life. It could be also a different gender than, you, than yourself and a race, a different lifestyle and so on. Even now, nowadays new games have different fashion looks and so on. Like, it's that advanced. Uh, but from the game, you can see that personal computers back then could not offer color. They were mainly using just vectors to kind of create their versions of these games. Um, and that's what changed next. Apple came out with their personal computer. And this was a huge leap technologically because it was a portal into a whole new other realm. It was the first computer that allowed for graphics. Um, there was a game called Mystery House, which was one of the first games uh, that had images. The images were simple, straightforward, nothing fancy, uh, but it was the first time that images were being used on a computer. Um, yeah, so now that graphics were allowed, uh, soon Richard Garriott made a new game called Ultima. It had characters and it had a story but it also allowed you to build your own world or like new places in your world. It was like a fantasy world to play in. This was the beginning of open world games. Open world games is another genre where it uses a game mechanic of allowing the player to explore and approach freely as opposed to a world which is more linear and constrained, you know? Um, it makes it possible for the player to fill in details how he or she would like it. And, you know, you could have your own narrative of the open world game. Um, so he created an epic world where you could venture forth on epic quests and equip yourself with different weapons and armors to kind of build on your own adventure. However, something uh, Richard noticed when he created this open world was that players would behave badly or brutally in the game. Like that was not the intention with which he made the game. Uh, they would act any way they want in the game and it would have absolutely no consequences. And this is what he wanted to change. So he started researching on ideas or uh, different aspects that he could use that could change this problem of his. Um, and soon later in his research, he came across the idea of an avatar. So what do you mean by an avatar? An avatar is the incarnation of a deity in human form. 
So it allows player as an option to be an avatar, basically transporting you from like this geek nerd on planet Earth to like a adventure buff in this fantasy world, right? And this is your avatar, but you are responsible for all the actions that and deeds that your avatar performs. So he allowed to bring, uh, he allowed players to bring their sense of right or wrong into the game. It was no longer just in the outside world, but it was also in the game world. The behavior you bring to the game impacts how your experience in the game also unfolds. So it kind of strictly said this idea of a code of conduct in the game. And this also has had a huge impact in video games that we play today. There are multiple video games that follow ethically this idea of code of conduct and it kind of controls your way the experience unfolds in a game. Um, so the next game I want to talk about is Final Fantasy, which is a game that is completely based on imaginative character drawings. Uh, they were made by artist uh, Yoshitako Amano. And it was like the first door or opening into this fantasy fictional world. The whole entire game had characters that do not exist in the real world. And they were heroes and there were monsters. And these creatures and characters gave Final Fantasy its incred incredible longevity. Um, Final Fantasy has had many versions and it is still a very, very popular game. There are dozens of prequels and sequels and spin-offs from the original game. So we basically reached this point in, uh, in video game history where it was now becoming easier to lose yourself into this world of game, to build connections with characters, to feel sympathy when things go wrong. Like you would have connections with other characters in the game. And Video game was a, a tool where you could inculcate empathy in the youth, in the players, you know? Uh, this is another very interesting game. So Gayblade was the first role-playing game that was completely focused on the LGBTQ community. Uh, it was designed by Ryan Best, who moved uh, to San Francisco in 1988 to get closer to the LGBTQ community. And they were having a lot of difficulties back then going through protests and so on. And for Ryan, coding was his form of protest. So he wanted to make something that he could share with other people from his community. So he made Gay Blade, which is an LGBTQ game. And this kind of allowed him to uh, cope up with his anger or frustration. Um, Gay Blade was a big, fabulous snub towards the people who were against the LGBTQ community. It cloaked social issues and morality in the disguise of a fantasy game. Um, Ryan actually received a lot of letters thanking him for making this game because a lot of people were going through this problem at that time. Uh, so role-playing games or RPGs were allowing players to be their most altruistic self but also allowing their inner demons to kind of escape. And in a short period of time, computer games went from like single text based on the screen to like crude graphics and character creations. So new competitions for Nintendo and Atari were arriving in the market. Uh, Sega was another Japanese company and they wanted to take over the gaming scene from Nintendo and target audiences from the West, all around the world, and so on. So they had, they placed their strategies using some games that I will show you now. Um, but what they also did was they launched Sega Genesis, which was basically one of the first 16-bit, uh, they went from, they moved from 8-bit to 16-bit home uh, video game consoles. And this 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 equipment basically defeated Nintendo machines for home consoles. Mm, so their first game that Sega came out with was Sonic. And this was designed with the idea that people love roller coasters. Um, 
they wanted to make a game that could defeat Mario. So uh, Hirokazu, the designer at Sonic, noticed that people in the West love roller coasters. So he decided to build a game world with that kind of an idea. Uh, as a marketing strategy, Sega uh, focused on an older audience. Like Nintendo was targeting 9 to 13. So Sega targeted from 13 to 20, like the teenage audience. And the idea was if the older sibling is playing uh, a video game, the younger one is definitely going to want to play it. Um, so Sonic was also another very famous game that came out uh, at the same time. Um, the other idea that Sega had that they wanted to get into sports games uh, and NFL was very famous back then. Uh, so a new company was formed called EA Sports and uh, they basically got on board John Madden, who is basically an American former football coach and sportscaster. And Madden was very interested in the prospect of this game because he wanted the resulting project to be used as a teaching tool. Being a coach himself, he was very excited of using a football game with the idea of teaching football. And uh, this game also went through lots of iterations and revolutions. In the beginning, they used all players of the same gender, but over time they could allow African-American uh, people also to come to be as like icons that you could pick from to make your game team. So this was another uh, game that, and now they have iterations. So it was so famous that EA Sports comes up with a new FIFA game every single year. And it, it has its own uh, fan following and kind of an audience. Um, however, it was only in 2016 that they had female uh, football players in their games. Uh, until then, you can see from these are covers of all FIFA games from uh, 95 till 15. And then in 2016 was the first time where they had female football players as teams also possible to play uh, FIFA for. Um, yeah, this is one of the probably one of the most uh, famous games out there. Um, so we've already seen that sound is a very important factor in video games. But the idea is, can effects also be one? Uh, Street Fighter was uh, a 1987 arcade game that was developed by Capcom. But it was also the first competitive fighting game that was produced. Uh, it was a commercial success in arcades. And it kind of made uh, introduced conventions that are made standard for fighting games that came later. Uh, you know, the six button controls and the command and all of that. Um, what they did is they also, when you start the game and you have to select your characters, they also had a female character as a player for in the game. Um, this was revolutionary because until then, females were just seen as damsels in distress or the cute uh, Miss Pac woman. <laughs> Miss Pac-Man uh, that I showed in the earlier slides. But now females were seen as uh, someone who could fight their own battles. Mm. Also, it was the first game that allowed two people to fight against each other in an arcade. So allowed for multiplayer games possible using games like Street Fighter. Um, as an extension, extension to this, there was another game that came out called Mortal Kombat. Uh, but Mortal Kombat was special because it took inspiration from cinema. Um, Bruce Lee had just become very famous with his movie Enter the Dragon. And this game wanted to bring back Kung Fu and, uh, you know, have focused a lot on the Kung Fu combat style. So they just went all out with their effects. And they just got so, I mean, these games have got so many versions now, it's it's just become so again. So not everyone thought that violence in games was cool and this whole court hearing is available online on YouTube. If someone's interested, I can just send you a link. And 
as a result there was a whole conversation there were a few games that were uh, there was a game called night trap which you know got famous because it went to court it wasn't famous before that and uh, parents were worried about all of this violence what is it doing to their children and that was when the esrb was formed uh which is basically the entertainment software rating board which now rates games according to the ages at what age is it appropriate uh for people to come and play these games you know so this was another huge step that made it uh important to be like hey when is this okay for my child to play or not um and then we had <laughs> we had the internet the the next technological advancement which was a pivotal moment when computers and consoles were about to enter a whole new dimension um pc games uploaded on a new platform called the internet and people got together all together on a server and then they finally got the game um so one of the first games that even i played uh was Wolfenstein 3D. Um the idea of immersion in gaming is a very important factor. Until now all the games that we have seen uh were played only in two dimensions. You could either move up, down, left, or right. But uh it was not possible for the player to be inside the game and this was what was made possible for the first time using Wolfenstein 3D. Now it was possible that the player could be like fully immersed in this world of the video game and these were all possible obviously with the new uh, technologies that were coming up it was possible now to share it amongst people all over the world using the internet and then came doom uh this was designed by john romero who wanted to make a game that was dark and scary His vision was that he wanted to make a game where players could enter, explore and play against each other. It was the first time that multiplayer was made possible over internet that was basically network. Uh so you could fight an alien invasion with your friend or also play against your friend, but you could totally be in two different parts of the world. Um Doom was also the first game that allowed for modding. Video game modding or short form for modification is the process where players can alter the game as they want. Uh it can be from small changes or like small tweaks to complete overhauls and it basically extends their replay value and interest in the game. So letting people mod a game also gives them kind of an insight what it could be to make new things you know and they can be more creative they can see as to what fits them the best and so on so that was a whole overview uh, like a history of the video game industry it's a billion dollar entertainment industry growing exponentially as we speak uh become even more popular during the last two years because a lot of people have gotten out there and playing video games um but each new game is an outcome of a technological innovation and it is always built on the foundation of a previous game um why do we see the gaming industry as a male dominated one um i don't know if anybody knows this but all the games that i have shown which have been uh, new advancements or new technological innovations they all have been designed by men so it kind of was like games were made by men for men in in such a way uh there were females involved but they were given a more admin or like a managerial role um but i think this is uh this is definitely definitely changing in this is in this day and time for a fact we have many female gamers we have many female game designers and if you see if you go online and look for statistics they always based per region but there are a lot of women out there now that are playing games designing games and so on um 
we've gone through i the other thing that i wanted to show with these all these games was also how how they look so i just want to kind of give you a little bit of a uh, quick glimpse into where are we now um i'm going to show you a uh, um game awards like a preview which is uh, from 2020 and it's just short clips of different games that were nominated for the best game awards in 2020 um hey can you please cue the video i'm going to stop sharing Well, that sounded fantastic. And now the game of the year award goes to The Last of Us Part Two. Thank you so much, Anoki. I think those were the impressions from the last video, which would have been takeaways, which are actually takeaways for me from this session. and i'm sure that there are many more that uh, others must be having and uh, thank you for this amazingly informative session and uh, i we just loved how uh, the topic of masculinity gender on a whole uh, was unfolded by you by associating it with the gaming playground and the evolution of games thank you so much for that and as much as we would have loved to discuss this with you further and um, it has really intrigued our interests but we would not like to steal uh, the time and we would actually invite questions from our audiences if there are any and um, you can post it in the chat box and i'll be 
asking them to anukhi on your behalf over to you the audiences do we have any does anybody want to post it now i think we'll wait for half a minute and then uh yeah sure uh meanwhile till audiences think of something uh i'm kind of uh, something i wanted to add is that i'm i'm very much interested in this idea of play and uh, as a curator at tifa working studios we are exploring this for our design and technology festival called siberia where uh, we kind of uh, look at different uh, creative ways of how video game elements can be used um, in different fields and we're having a conference on uh, it's a virtual conference on 16th and 17th of september uh, which is in a few days where we basically invite different speakers uh, who are using different elements from video game design in their practice in their works so different ways that you can see and kind of also follow that approach in my studio um so yeah just something i forgot to add uh, uh before we left we have some questions yeah um so there is one question from trishla what are the biases in game culture why are more women not playing games uh so this is an interesting question uh trishla um so we also uh uh at tifa we kind of did a research on why games are not being played uh in india by women because uh there are a lot of uh there are a lot of people uh, women playing games in the west but in india it's still not so famous and uh the most interesting and the answer that got most amount of uh percentage was women don't know how to start playing video games and it's like they've always seen like their brothers or their friends playing video games with their friends but they have not had like i there was some at some point i wondered why my friends don't play video games when i do um and i think this is something that uh, me and a bunch of women in india are trying to change we're trying to make create more of an awareness that games are not just for men <laughs> I know it started that way in the gaming industry but it's kind of changing now and uh constantly what you can do is just get in touch with a female gamer I'm available anybody who wants any questions about what game to start playing with I'm happy to help and just being like hey let's play this um and yeah something we constantly address um uh, there is one more comment not a question a comment from harshit mittal and he says uh, i love the overall presentation i happened to play a lot of games as a kid uh, but i never thought about it the, that way until today so i think um, on this note uh, i hope uh, you all enjoyed the presentation and i hope you all enjoyed the talk oh there are okay so there are a few more questions coming in but sure <laughs> i think we can have one of them because uh, we will have to move over to the other session and we will be sharing it so we have a minutes time more uh, so there is a question from aditi mittal aditi happens to be one of our uh, key speakers also today this evening who will be doing a yeah. stand up so uh, aditi is asking can you recommend a video game for a starter Yeah, sure, Aditi. Uh, one of the video games that I recently played is by this artist called David O'Reilly, and his game is called Everything. And it's it's basically you as a player can become go into the world, and you can be a grass, or you can be a bug, or you could be a bottle, or you could be a building, and then you interact with other things. And it's not violent. It's not it's not got any strategy or any goal. It's basically you exploring the game. and going through different uh, you could be different animals different objects and so on and this is i think this is a brilliant game to start with it has amazingly beautiful visuals um works on the computer and the mac so uh, that is also not a problem so i think uh, that is a um, a brilliant game to start with 
so thank you anoki for these insights and thanks again everyone for joining us uh, we have many more interesting sessions on diverse topics related to masculinities that will follow this one